My name's Paul Bestall. This is Mysteries and Monsters on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Welcome to this week's Mysteries and Monsters. Well, we've had a great response to our last episode featuring Linda Godfrey, so thank you for all the kind words. I'm glad to know people are enjoying what we do. This week, I'm joined by one of Britain's most prolific paranormal authors, Jeff Holder. Jeff has written over 30 books covering mysterious and ghostly occurrences in Scotland, but today we discuss his magnum opus, Poltergeist over Scotland. It was Jeff's intent to create a companion volume to the legendary ghost hunter Harry Price, whose book Poltergeist over England was released way back in 1945. Jeff's book covers over 500 years of poltergeist cases from Scotland and is a must for anyone interested in pults, spooks and things that go bump in the night. Don't forget before we dive into the interview, to follow us on Facebook, we're on Instagram and Twitter, and keep subscribing to our YouTube channel. The more subscribers we get, the more people can find the show. Don't forget you can also support us on Patreon for a dollar a month. Now, let's take a journey into Scotland's haunted history. My guest tonight needs no introduction if you've read any books about ghosts, ghoulies and poltergeists in Scotland over the last 15 years, with over 25 books covering more ghosts and hauntings than you can shake a Bible at. Jeff Holder has produced some of the best written and most well-researched books about the paranormal I've ever had the privilege to read. He's now moved into TV and film as a screenwriter, with a couple of films already released, and Dark Sense received its world premiere at the Boston Sci-Fi Festival in February of this year. Jeff... Thank you, and welcome to joining Mysteries and Monsters today. You're very welcome. So, um, most authors, uh, I would suggest, probably aren't as prolific and as as consistently good as yourself, Jeff. Um, You've released enough books about the paranormal to, to have your own section in a library. Where on earth did this prolific love of the paranormal come from? Uh, it is basically living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to be very, to be very concise, uh, I grew up in an industrial city where one's horizons for the future were very limited, mm. um, and I found my escape in in the local library, where I had read every book every horror book, every supernatural book, every fantasy and sci-fi book by the time I left primary school. Mm. And now I get to write about that stuff, which is, you know, pretty cool. It is. It is. I mean, was it was it a conscious... I mean, obviously, uh, it sounds like you had a very similar childhood to my to myself because I, I grew up in a, a, a towards the end of the miners uh, era in, in South Yorkshire. So essentially... Uh, you had two choices, which was either stay and fight off boredom for the rest of your life, or or move on and try and get, you know, get away and and push yourself more, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's one of those aspects that uh, at that era that the library becomes a kind of escape uh, from the from the normality of of those kind of that kind of upbringing, really. So it's interesting that you kind of embraced it and, and, and developed it. Was it was it something you consciously then moved into after leaving school, Jeff? No, no, it took me decades, decades, um, possibly centuries past um, <laughs> uh, it, um, before um, 
I, I kind of had a, I suppose, a small revelation. I was I was living in uh, Scotland, mm. and I was spending my weekends exploring the area, going to all the stone circles and the castles and all the fantastic historical sites. Mm. And I thought, what I need is a book that tells me where all these places are and tells me about the folklore and stories and the mysteries associated with those. And I couldn't find a book, so I decided to write it. Uh, and that was called The Guide to Mysterious Perthshire. Mm-hmm. And, and I pitched it to a, a publisher, which, and I said, you write, you publish books on local history and you publish books on the history of witchcraft. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle. And they said, yeah, OK. You know, and uh, that led to a series of similar books about specific locations in Scotland. The Guide to Mysterious Glasgow, Aberdeen, Sky and so and so on. And also the Lake District. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of developed a, um, I suppose, a niche. Um, and that sort of enabled me to eventually give up my job and become a full time author. Fantastic. So when was your first book released then, Jeff? 2006. Yeah, so it was kind of like a, uh, 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 as you as you refer to a revelation that you essentially just embraced and, and just went for the opportunity then. Yeah, that's right. Yes, I I had this remarkable moment. I'd had three books published with the same publisher, mm. um, and I was you know still working full time. And um, they said, you know, what else you got? And I pitched them six ideas. I expect them to say yes to one. They said yes to all six. Wow. And I thought, okay, maybe I should give up my job and do this all the, you know, full time. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, do you do you think that it's it's been more beneficial for you that you've kind of got into this later in life and you've you've kind of um, moved into it as 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 a career rather than kind of trying to 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 create that niche as you refer to, you know, as a younger person. I can't say whether it was more beneficial. It's just something that that happened. Mm. You know, it wasn't part of the plan, and then it became the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, was it a natural progression? You know, as you refer to, you started doing the mysterious books primarily because there wasn't that kind of uh, guide for uh, someone interested in those subjects out there. Did you kind of, as that developed, did you start to think, well, I need to start looking at more specific? Uh, parts of the paranormal or did it just it was a natural progression once again well yeah uh, um what the 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 life of an author is very much um how shall we say a ne- series of negotiations with publishers <laughs> which is basically i want to write this and publisher says no <laughs> and eventually <laughs> you say i want to write this they say yeah okay you can write that one um uh but also it it it, what I was doing, I was, I was basically doing lots of boots on the ground research. You know, I was, I was basing myself in a certain part of Scotland and I would go around everywhere in that location. And I found myself doing things like vis- visiting lots and lots of graveyards, as you do. Yeah. You know? So I vis- there's a pathological amount of Scottish graveyards, and I, I thought, you know, there's something really unusual going on, on here. There's lots of stories about grave robbing. Body snatching. So I wrote a book about body snatching simply because I've been to all these graveyards yeah. and I was I was um, finding lots of stories about witchcraft. So I wrote a book on witchcraft. And um, and then as I was accumulating these stories about hauntings, about ghosts, sort of folkloric stories, I was also accumulating tales and episodes about poltergeists. Yeah. And poltergeists are, are very fascinating for me because Unlike folkloric stories, with poltergeists, particularly more recent cases, what you have is sometimes physical evidence, but often you have multiple eyewitness evidence mm. and documentary evidence. And that's that means that someone like me can interrogate that evidence. And, bec- and it also suggests there's something about poltergeists that are very different to other elements of what we call the paranormal, mm. um, and it occurred to me if they if poltergeists are real, or should I say, if some of the poltergeist phenomena is 
evidential, mm. then laws of physics are being broken. Yeah. And if laws of physics are being broken in reality, as this thing from people making up stories or misinterpreting what they've experienced, then there's a new paradigm there. And that's really fascinating to me that Polterus could be uh, a kind of the window into finding a new way of uh, analyzing and understanding the universe. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I, I have a very similar love of, of poltergeist out of all aspects of the paranormal, Jeff. It's, it's the one thing that, that, that gets my juices flowing because I just find them incredibly fascinating as you, as you refer to some of the more modern cases and, you know, infamous cases such as Enfield. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I was I was lucky enough to speak to Dr. Melvin Willin, uh, mm. um, who I who I know in in your uh, volume of Poltergeist over Scotland, you you, you uh, acknowledge him in the beginning of the book, and, mm. and I I've just since I was because obviously I was a small child when that that happened. I was I wasn't far off the age of the children involved, so and obviously at the time it was all over the daily mirror and it was it was a big sensation for a, for a young lad living in a boring town <laughs> um I, I i've just been since that i it's the one thing i've i've always gravitated towards in regards to the paranormal and, and it's they they are just perplexing yes yes and as i said something about you know uh, whatever theory you have about poltergeists they will trump it they will behave <laughs> differently to the way you think that poltergeist, whatever you think poltergeists are, they will decide to do the opposite. If they, if they, if at all they decide to do anything, you know, it, you know, begs the question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, there obviously there are many a many a, a, a case of, of poltergeists that that seem to enjoy the attention mm-hmm. um, and and end up performing for a variety of witnesses. But yeah, um, I mean, your book. Uh, as I just mentioned, Poltergeist over Scotland. It, ironically, I just finished Harry Price's oh, right, yeah. Poltergeist over England, and um, I saw your and, and, and I didn't, I wasn't aware you'd done another Poltergeist book because I think you've done two, haven't you? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, uh, and the first one was was fascinating. Um, so for me, I just thought, well, this is fantastic because um, the one criticism i would have over price's original book was the fact that it was just so focused on england i mean it's a it's a massive volume mm-hmm. by any stretch of the imagination um specifically just dealing with cases on poltergeist in england so to see yours for me it was a perfect compliment and and i just found it an incredible work it was a fantastic book jeff oh. Thank you so much, sir. And 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 the the money will be in the post for you soon. <laughs> I mean, the one thing I've I've always enjoyed about your your work is that it, you know, as I referred to in the in the introduction, they're excellently written and they're they're pitched at a level of uh, not necessarily intellect, but s- s- very often you can read books about the paranormal and it's very simplistic, Jeff. Mm. Um, and and I think you give credit to the to the reader by the way that you write. And it it's you know it's not it's a it's a challenging read if you're not used to that kind of uh, level of of depth and and, and also uh, a dark strand of humour that seems to uh, permeate your work, which I appreciate entirely. Um, did you did you find it easy to because of your experience on the other books? Because, like I say, the Poltergeist book is so well researched, and the depth in it is is staggering in in places, Jeff. Um, did I find it easy to to research? Yeah, I mean, because of how how much depth oh, is in yeah. the Poltergeist book. Okay, um, the 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 previous volumes have basically taught me how to research because uh, I hadn't been trained in in, the, in this area. Um, and then I, I mean, Paul, you cannot imagine just how extensive my library on the subject is. <laughs> yeah, I, I have got, you know, everything that I could get my hands on. Yeah. And I spent a great deal of time sifting through archives. I spent a great deal of time going through, you know, uh, not only the national archives in Edinburgh, but local archives in specific towns and cities yeah. where I found some some hint or some uh, mention of a poltergeist case and and then i started looking through you know newspapers and journals and 
Um, the more you look and the, the dustier you get, <laughs> I can tell you that your hands, your, your fingers are covered with black stuff when you open these things that haven't been looked at for possibly decades, yeah. maybe centuries. You discover more and more. And, um, you know, that it, it was it was easy because it was a pleasure, mm. but it was real solid hard work for months to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can appreciate that because, like I said, I mean, the cross referencing and, and uh, the, the the some of the, the research that's gone in, like I say, I mean, the, the one thing that struck me after after reading it is that um, the first part of the book is obviously dealing with the, the earliest cases because obviously you've done the whole thing chronologically. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's weird for me that, that there just seems to be a, a, a complete absence, well, not absence, but the change from the reporting of poltergeists in the 17th century to, to near enough the suppression of it throughout the 18th century because I find it really odd that it just seems to... I, th I think you refer it, uh, to it in the second part where you say that it, it's kind of poo-pooed by the intellectuals and it's old-fashioned thoughts and a, a more simplistic view of the world. Yes. It, 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 um, everything in human experience, including the experience of the paranormal, is fashion. Mm. Every, we, our fashions change depending on the world in which we live in and in the 16th century and the 17th century um, people believed in satan they believed in demons and they believed in witchcraft and they believed in ghosts so that was just part of the life of the majority of people certainly the majority of people in the countryside mm. by the 18th century we have the enlightenment yeah. and, 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 and a new intellectual wave uh, spreads throughout Europe and it d did a great deal of good um, in a, it brought um, sort of Britain and Europe more into into a sort of modern way of thinking mm. and, a and a lot of the enlightenment thinking was that everything to do with ev I mean everything to do with witchcraft and, and the supernatural was basically superstition yes um, and uh, that it was um, therefore to be disregarded and that it would be a bit like saying you go, you went into the, the, your local Tesco's and say, I believe in fairies. Yeah. You know, people would just laugh at you because in the intellectual context of our time, fairy belief is not very um, current. Mm. Um, whereas if you went, if you were in a pub in the 17th century and said, I believe in witches, nobody would disagree with you. But in, in, in depending on your level of education, depending on your status in society, by the 18th century you might well you might well start to to believe to believe that. It doesn't mean that poltergeist cases stopped. It's simply that they stopped being reported. Mm. That's that that's the big difference. Yeah, I, I mean the other aspect of it is, is, is it's not only is it a fantastic record of the of the history of poltergeist in in Scotland. But I, it, it's very interesting. You can see the cultural changes as well as you as you touched on there, because obviously in the first part of the book, everybody everything's kind of uh, attributed to Satan. It's it's the devil at work and possession and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you've got to sort of the the latter part of the 18th and early 19th century, it they're ghosts. They mm. just that they, they've become a standalone phenomena. Yes, that's right. Uh, Satan has been banished. Witchcraft doesn't exist. Uh, the fairies are something that is uh, something that only deals with for children. Yeah. And so what can they be? Well, they can either be hoaxes, uh, frauds, or they can be ghosts. That's pretty much all that's left. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it is interesting as well. I mean, the other thing that, uh, that is a comparison with the Price book is that a lot of the early reports, it seems that the only... The only people that were taking these situations seriously were was the local reverend or, or, or church minister a, a, across the country. And in in many cases, this is particularly for the older cases in Scotland. This is related to the um, the gosh, what we can call what can cause uh, internecine religious warfare mm. that 
you know, that af afflicted the country for a very long time. And it's not just between Protestants and Catholics. It was between various strands of Protestantism. Mm. Um, um, and as part of that, as a sort of a parallel th thing to go, that we had the rise of skepticism that, that people... Uh, even by the you know the 17th century, people were saying, "Well, I'm not sure that the you know there really are witches. I'm not sure about this." And so many um, uh, uh, vicars, many many religious men, many Protestant religious men, were writing pamphlets and books, basically saying, "There is Satan. Satan does exist. Witches exist. Because if you don't believe in Satan and witches, you don't believe in God." And they, they had this real fear of, of, of athe atheism, um, which wasn't real atheism, but, you know, they, they had this real fear that their their worldview was under attack. And so to protect it, to defend it, they came up, well, not they came up with, but they were using the poltergeist phenomena as proof of demonic forces. And if demonic forces exist, then therefore God exists. And to deny the, the demonic forces is to deny God. That's basically the argument in a great many of the 17th century poltergeist pamphlets. Yeah, I mean, it, it's clearly an absorption of, of superstition mm -hmm. um, in a way to kind of, I wouldn't necessarily say embrace these people, but to certainly encourage them that perhaps if they weren't regular attenders at the local church yeah. or, or they weren't particularly uh, involved in that part of the community, that the door was open for them because it, they understood it. Yes, very much so. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it is crucial, I think, like like you say, and it's very interesting the way that, especially when it comes to the paranormal and religion, they become very much intertwined when it seems that one is overpowering the other, in, in, especially in, in perhaps some more remote areas of not just Scotland, but it would, it would have been the same around the UK at the same time, I would imagine. Absolutely. Um, um, and the, the, the essence is, is that ever since, um, ever, uh, I think probably ever, ever since the, Reformation, but you know, probably a bit later, uh, religion, the Christian religion in Britain has felt under attack mm. um, through, from uh, science, from skepticism, from enlightenment thinking, um, from people just not paying attention to go to go to church anymore, and that many of these uh, episodes provide opportunities for the, the the people from the church to insert themselves into the narrative uh, and say that, you know, it's the work of Satan and, you know, turn to God and everything will be fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we can see a very modern comparison of that because obviously the Catholic Church over the last few years has constantly gone about um, what you could call, in essence, uh, a recruitment drive for exorcists. Mm. Um, a, a, a branch of the Catholic Church it's, within the Catholic Church is actually quite controversial. Uh, but you're right, there has been a growth in exorcists and therefore there's been a growth in demand, in, which, which meets a growth in demand for exorcism. And we have to wonder why, why, that, why that is happening. It seems to be principally in a number of European countries, um, Africa as well. Mm. Um, and I, I, I honestly don't know why it is happening, but it is something that is evident that perhaps something that <clears throat> even only 50 years ago, uh, some of the more the enlightened members of the, of, the, of the Catholic Church would have said, no, we, we can't pay attention to this because this makes us look superstitious and backward. We have to go along the line of science and say it's something to do with psychology. It's something to do with you know, what's happening in people's minds. Now we seem to be seeing a backlash against that where we're saying, well, actually, you know what? Satan is still active and we still need uh, exorcists to, um, to get rid of him and his minions. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very interesting cultural response, I think, because these days the paranormal is is seen by many as as light hearted entertainment for me. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, with a myriad of of ghost hunting programs, are, I would imagine in, shown in every country in the world these days. Um, you, you'd be really surprised. I live in France at the moment and the French do not take the, the supernatural seriously at all. There, there is no equivalent French equivalent of most haunted or anything like that. That, that, that just doesn't, that kind of stuff. But 
I do know that, I mean, like in the US, Canada um, and uh, Spain has some as well. Um, I've, Russia has got, uh, has got one. You know, uh, it depends on the culture, but they are very widespread. And as you said, they are entertainment. Uh, yes, there is no doubt of, about that because uh, that's, they're certainly <laughs> not uh, the most serious uh, investigatory. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So, I mean, in regards to the poltergeist phenomenon, I mean, were you surprised? Because I certainly was to, to see the, the number of cases in, in Scotland. Um, yes, I was. Once I started researching, I'd, I'd only heard of some of the more uh, notorious cases, you know, like the, the, you know, the, 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 the big numbers. But uh, when, 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 we, when I started digging further and further, I was truly astonished. Um, 134 cases from the 1630s to 2012. Um, I, and that seems to me quite a lot. For quite for a small nation. Yeah, and and especially when you take into consideration, you know, as as we've touched on a couple of times, that that th one of the chapters is essentially ten pages for us for a whole century. Yes, because because it was unfashionable, so no nobody was noting them down. Yeah. Because that it was in, it was in, to do so would be to embarrass yourself to to write about these things in that in the in that particularly intellectual climate. Yeah, it's. It's it's intriguing, and, and I mean, I'm sure some people would would make the 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 connection between uh, the religious belief and community being quite strong up and you know continuing well into the 20th century in Scotland. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure others would perhaps point to a to a wider spiritual connection with the paranormal as well in 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 the way that traditions and, and folklore has, has, has been an integral part of, of the Scottish nation? Ooh. <laughs> um, perhaps you should, you should speak to someone Scottish about that. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. That's true. Um, but it's, I, I found it, a, a, like I say, an incredible amount for, for, for a small country and, and so well reported as well. And it's, there seems to be um, a real... I mean, on, on a couple of cases, there seems to be a bit of pride in in specific mm. cases and, and what it brought to the area, strangely. Yes, in in, in some cases. Um, and, and but often these things were were they were the, what you might call the pride comes in books that were written long after the events. It, it, it's a sort of. Looking back, not 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 nostalgia isn't quite the word, but there is a sort of sense of uh, historical achievement, if you like, in, in in some of these works that are that were published long after the actual events that that were that, that took place. Yeah, I mean it 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 is um, like you say a very fascinating aspect of it because it it just seems that um, certain areas of Scotland, it's for them it's second nature that if something weird goes off. Clearly, poltergeist. That, that, that's the sip. There's no ifs and buts, really. Well, I don't know about that. Um, I, because, firstly, the word with the word poltergeist isn't isn't known until you know the the, the fourth decade of the the nineteenth century, at least not 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 in the English language. Um, and so, and it's not really well known as a, as a, as a word up in, and until perhaps. Um, a certain film came out in the uh, you know, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. Um, so, the, but to ascribe it to a to a, to a poltergeist is often describing it to something else. Mm. You know, it's a ghost, it's witch, witchcraft, it's a it's it's a demon, and then uh, it, it's or it's or it's it's a hoax. Mm. You know, it's uh, but it, there is certainly a the very a very extensive and rich scene of poltergeist material in in Scottish life. Yeah, I mean, it, as you refer to there, the the catch all every every case is a hoax um, tends to to really push the boundaries of of 
of what could be accepted as an explanation because it's, some of these cases you've got scores of witnesses not just a couple yeah, yeah scores of you got police officers you know you got members of the local gentry you got respectable tradespeople you know um you you've you've got really um convincing sets of witnesses um who and in some cases have put their names to written documents saying these things did happen mm. which is a you know a, a big thing i would say for 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 a, a, someone a respectable member of society yeah. um so you know yeah. well i mean clearly that shows the the, the conviction they have in in what yeah. they, that what they've experienced because like you say there are numerous cases where you know I mean, there are several that refer to the, the sporadic breaking out of fires, which I've always found a, like a fascinating subsection mm. of, of, of poltergeist phenomenon, because that doesn't tend to hop, happen very often. Um, but it no. cer certainly seems to occur in, in, in the ones where it's got a whole range of tricks for its, for its intended yeah. audience. And um, I did a breakdown of uh, the, the, the percentages of various uh, effects. And if I remember rightly, uh, fires took place in uh, about 5%, something like that, of, of the, of the uh, cases. Um, uh, no, sorry, excuse me, fire or smoke in... Almost 12% of the cases, and most of those cases were early cases. There's not much fire in recent cases. Yeah, that that is something I've I I, I re noticed now. You point that out. And it's it's the same with the uh, the Price book about England. It it seems to be a very specific, you know, sort of 18th 19th century where yeah. where they got a bit yeah. maniacal about yeah. things yeah. and. Uh, I mean, it, it may be something else. It may be there may be a material element to here to this. If you look at the early cases, they mostly take place in rural locations, and there's going to be lots of things that can catch fire there. Mm. So that is, there's lots of material. So perhaps in the more modern, I mean, I'm speculating here, but perhaps in the more modern cases, there's less material for the the, the pulp to play with. But there, there there are things such as water. Water is plentiful. Um, there's um, electricity, there's telephones, there are the, the new things that, that, that pulse, pulse can play with. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's, sim it's simply that the pulse are evolving, they're adapting to our material circumstances. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is a fascinating aspect that when you, when you think about it, obviously, they, they seem to adapt to the, to the advances yeah. in human technology as though they think, oh, brilliant, we've got a new toy to learn about. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, I mean, uh, it's only a few years ago that Pulse started, in the famous case in England, Pulse started communicating via mobile phone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's, uh, that's a chiller, that one. It's a yeah, very, it very scary yeah. story. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I just found it, I mean, there's a, there's a very famous case from Germany where, the, where one of the key aspects of that case, along with the usual... Uh, moving of furniture and pictures and light fittings was that the speaking clock was just basically rung yeah. like a machine gun it was uh, being being, uh, being dialed so f much faster than a human could dial it yeah, um, yeah. and it, it just i mean I, I know they try to replicate it and it just beggars belief because you, you get these people come i mean they had the phone company come out check the wiring they rewired it it still carried on and nobody could replicate the speed of the <laughs> dialing under any circumstances. It was incredible. It's another, another example of Pulse doing things that seem to defy uh, physical laws. You know, um, and, and that's one of the reasons why they're so fascinating. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible array of, of phenomena that they tend to bring. Some of the, you know, some of the most prolific tend to... It's as if they build strength through, through, through some because often these cases start quite slowly reach a crescendo and then either just stop suddenly or they just drift away like a whimper you've you've got it exactly Pult cases almost never start with a big bang they build up gradually and as you say they reach a crescendo and sometimes that crescendo is is brief 
and intense, and other times the crescendo can last for days or even weeks. But as yet, and then it stops or fades away for no apparent reason, just in the same manner it starts for no apparent reason. That's 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 the classic arc of a a, a, a poltergeist event. Yeah, and I mean it's always been interesting because I, I've always found them curious cases because it's very easy to say oh well it, it's all down to puberty and electrical discharge and things like that and then you come across cases where well that's not happening because there is nobody going through puberty or there's no children of that age mm -hmm. in that area so then you think well it's the same kind of phenomena so surely that's not the reason then or do you think there, is, there are different aspects to different poltergeist cases Jet? Well, well, firstly, the, the notion of the disturbed adolescent uh, be, became, it's, it's become a kind of default yeah. now. When it, at, at one point in the, in the 20th century, it was, it was cutting edge ideas. It was an analysis of numerous um, uh, poltergeist cases, specific, uh, very much in the United States, and they found at their center a disturbed adolescent, someone who was either going through puberty or was, was having problems in their life. And the suggestion was that, that this was, um, and, and, and the, their internal turmoil was being externalized, which is, which fits the evidence from a wide range of cases. And because it was such a great idea, become, somehow became adapted and became, well, this must be the, the only explanation. But numerous poltergeist cases do not have, as you say, they do not have not only they don't have disturbed adolescent, they don't have an adolescent at all. They they there are there are pod cases that appear to people who are aged to very young children. There are pod cases that where the pod seems to move from person to person, which once again indicates that there is really no taxonomy of pods, hmm. because whatever you think they are, they do something different. <laughs> They're just perverse. <laughs> yeah but that's that's a very good description of them i i tend to think of the, they've in in quite a lot of 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 the biggest cases there's a there's a there's a dark sort of malevolent sense of humor to some of their 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 games and their and the, the aspects of what they've unleashed i think they they kind of act a bit like um playground bullies <laughs> there, there's, a, there's, there's a kind of gleeful, low-key sadism uh, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that they seem to exhibit. Um, is this indicative of some kind of conscious uh, force behind it? I have no idea. But it does, some of the, some of the cases do seem to suggest that we're, we're dealing with not the brightest bunch of um, <laughs> entities from the supernatural lexicon, mm. but possibly some of the, um, the most, uh, the, the, not, not the evil, but the kind of, the kind of, you know, unthinking vandals. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't seem to have any sort of perception of, of what their actions would, would cause. No, no, no. It's just like, I'll, I'll do this because I can. And because it, it uh, I enjoy tormenting people. Yeah, I think that's that's another good point to, the, to that because what, the other aspect is if if you think about the amount of cases where there are people who claim to have been physically injured mm -hmm. in such hauntings, they're not that numerous either. When you consider this explosion of energy, Jeff. Yes, I mean if 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 pots can move objects through the air, can push heavy furniture, can displace objects through walls, can turn glass objects into, the, into its component sand, can set fires and can mess with electricity. The energy output is astonishing. And yet relatively little bit is pointed directly towards humans in a really dangerous manner. Mm. They hurt, but they don't kill. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the only case that jumps out, uh, and I'm sure you'll correct me if, the, if you can think of a, 
any others, Jeff, is, is obviously the Bell Witch uh, yes. from the States, where obviously that was a, a, a yeah. concerted campaign against that, the that father was, of the family. That's a very good example. There's there, the only thing. I, there's a couple of examples in my book of really early, like 17th century stuff, where they injured animals. Mm. Um, but I can't think of any. I can't think of a, a, a fatal event in certainly in Scotland uh, involving a poult. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Yeah. I mean, there are numerous cases where people have, you know, received scratches and mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and the feeling of being uh, physically attacked. I think Pontifract um, yes. Is, a, yes. is a famous case where the daughter yeah. was dragged up the stairs backwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, pushing, pushing, shoving, punching, scratching, slapping. Mm. These things take place. Um, in the in the cases in, in the book, I think it's about fourteen percent of the, the cases had some some form of assault. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Which in the in the perception of it is is still quite a small amount, really. Yes, when you consider that the vast majority of pulp cases involve revolve around the movement of objects and uh, the the making of noises. Yeah, it's and uh, I mean it's always I always enjoy the ones. Where they they start off going a bit Ooh, and making funny noises, and then within a certain period of time, all of a sudden, they, they they're you know capable of having conversations, or they suddenly develop a a vein of sarcasm with any yeah. sort of communication, which I always find hilarious. It, which it, 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 a number of pulps develop distinct personalities. Mm. They they have they either lecture people or they have conversations with people. Now, here's a, here's a curious thing about what we were talking earlier about, about pulse adapting to uh, the period. In the 17th century, pulse would talk about religion. You know, they, they, they would argue religion with, with ministers. You don't find pulse doing that nowadays. You know, nobody would go, people just go, well, what are you talking about? That's just boring. You know, I don't even know what, you, I don't even know what, you, what you're saying. But at the time, it was something that they, that pulse seemed to, Scottish pulps, anyway, mm-hmm. seem to be um, a, a quite passionate about. Yeah, they seem to be, uh, appreciate the theological challenge. Yeah, and then, <laughs> there's this case from uh, from Greenock in the late 19th century, where the investigator thought he heard amongst the thumps some kind of uh, musical tune, mm. so he whistled the tune. And the pult banged in time to the tune. So the guy then whistled two more well-known Scottish airs, and the pult tapped along in time to the to the to the music. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that to me is is absolutely astonishing. Because what do pults know about music? Because I no no other pult I've heard about can 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 carry a tune. Yeah. But that, but. But by and large, people don't sing to pulse. People don't whistle to pulse. But in this case, this guy did, and that's how it responded. Yeah, I, I find it quite an interesting reversal of the mimicry because usually it's you know one tap for for no, two taps for yes. Yeah. yeah. And he kind of turned the table and said, right, well, give me give me your best area and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> you come in, I'll play. Uh, wouldn't, it. It be, <laughs> no, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if something like that happened to like a rap artist? <laughs> that would just be. Great, that would be. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, a rap battle across the rounds. A rap battle with a pulse, yeah. I, I'm sure if we go searching for it, Jeff, I'm positive we'll find somebody on YouTube that claims to be able to rap with uh, <laughs> with Biggie Smalls or Tupac. And yeah, no, I have no doubt, yes. <laughs> there, well, that's that's my homework for later, I think. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I'll not share my endeavours. Um, it's it's an intriguing, like you say, the, the whole thing. Um, it would be interesting because um, these days th- there doesn't seem to be many vocal poltergeist case reported. Yeah, they got they 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 if they communicate at all, and then the rare cases where they do, it's by arranging letters on on a fridge or on a wall, by writing or by mobile phone. They tend not to speak. Why is that? I have no idea. Yeah, 
well, perhaps once again, they're culturally absorbing what it is to be a millennial. Yes. Yeah, yeah maybe. maybe yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? You know, that maybe that's the thing. I mean, there was um, there's a there's a wonderful podcast uh, from the States called Monsters and Moments, which um, involves people ringing up with their own experiences across a whole range of 40 and topics. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a gentleman that rang uh, recently who was FaceTiming someone. Uh, uh, I think it was his cousin and she was at her boyfriend's house uh, and he was chatting to her and he didn't think anything of it. But there was a gentleman sat behind his, his cousin. So the next time he talked to her, he's like, oh, yeah, brilliant. How, how, who was the guy? Because her boyfriend was Mexican and this was an old white guy just sat mm-hmm. randomly on a settee. And apparently she'd complained about problems in the house things moving about noises and stuff um so she was stunned and i i was thinking there seems to be not many of those type of kind of situations occur recently either no not 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 that many that i've that i've heard of yeah so it's 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 weird how it seems to only but then again i suppose with the myriad i know there's there's a few uh, alleged, you know, YouTube accidental videos, and oh my God, what's this? <coughs> <laughs> I, I just had something in my throat there. So. Yes, uh, my my tongue is firmly in my cheek because I've I've yet to see a compelling one. Um, <laughs> but it it it's that seems quite odd in in its uniqueness as well because that's that's quite a well attested story. Hmm. I mean, yep. would you would you suspect that? that's something that would develop or, or or do you think that as you refer to their poltergeists just aren't really that bothered in that kind of uh media well, at the moment <laughs> I, you know you know i've never actually spoken to a poltergeist and may be able to sit down and interview one so i don't know what don't know how they think if indeed they do think mm. uh if indeed they do have some kind of conscious thinking apparatus mm. um uh, you know I, I could answer that in one way and tomorrow a, a pult will turn up somewhere and do something completely different yeah, um, they 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 are adaptive, but we can't predict their adaptation. Yeah, very much. Well, I think it's one of those things, isn't it? Because yeah, as as numerous cases attest to, just when you think you've you've got its number, it moves mm-hmm. on to something else. It's it's gone right. Okay, you think you've bested me at this? I'll, mm-hmm. I'll I'll do this. You know, I mean, one of the most consistent aspects of them is. Is the incredibly loud noises that seem to occur in a in a large number of cases that are that are you know deafening to the to the people that hear them, and yet often there is zero evidence or source for such a, a yeah an aspect that's of right. phenomena. You may you may be um, aware of an article that appeared in fourteen times in elsewhere a number of years ago, where an acoustic engineer analysed. Uh, the taps that have been recorded at poltergeist events. Uh, do you know about this? No, no. Oh, oh it, 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 to me, it's one, it's one of the most amazing pieces of um, recent scientific-based research. So it's a number of poltergeist rec- taps have been recorded in different locations, mostly in Europe, some in the UK. Mm. And he took these recordings and he analysed the sound. Now, when you hit like your desk with your knuckles, what happens is that there is a rise in noise and then it decays. Mm. Okay, that's what happened. And there's a very, the rise in noise is, is very, very speedy. Yeah. Uh, but there is, in the, and then, then, then there's a decay. And he analyzed this sound and he said, it doesn't behave like somebody hitting the, the, the surface. It behaves as if the noise is generated from within the material, mm. which you know, begs the question: How does a pot do that? But it seems to be that it's not hitting the object and to make that noise. Mm. It's generating sound in a different way, which once again is back to back to something that we've mentioned again and again, which is that pulses seem to break what we currently considered to be the laws of physics yeah yeah i mean there is numerous cases that, um, i mean there's one case that you refer to i think from the from the 19th 18th century sorry where it one of the descriptions of the noise is it it sounded like a sledgehammer but muffled mm. 
um, but the noise seemed to emanate from within the wall rather than be a response to being struck. Yes, yes. And that is that is absolutely typical. When you have lots of loud noises, it's see, it, we're, we're so used to loud noises being created by two objects striking each other. That's how noise is created. But the the pulse seem to have a different idea of how to make noise. Yeah, it's it's as if they can construct it on a molecular level. Yes, that's that's that 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 is the kind of thing I'm sort of hinting at. It's as if they can manipulate matter at the molecular level, yeah. which is like woo, woo <laughs> beyond, beyond woo. Yeah, I mean that takes us into a whole new, uh, well, a whole new expansion of of our current understandings of yes. physics. Yes, it does. Yes, but I think we. we the way yep. things are these days, things seem to be so rapidly progressing um, across an, an numerous scientific fields at the moment, Jeff. Nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> um, so, in regards to 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 your love of the of the poltergeist, what was your favourite case out of out of this wonderful volume of Scottish cases? My favourite case, um, apart from the apart from the the the, the, the poltergeist that could. Um, sort of, you know, sing along or, or at least carry um, one along. Uh, my favourite case, uh, I, I kind of, I like to go back to some of the really early ones because they are, in some cases, they're, they're, they're extensively documented. That's one, that's one of the things that I like about them, that uh, the, the documentation may be um, a form of propaganda, Mm. But it's, it's still sort of uh, fascinating. Here, here's here's one here's one of my favorite. This is from Aberdeenshire. It's not one that's not particularly well known. It's it's in a location called Botari in, in Aberdeenshire. In, took place in the year 1644. Mm. So what we have, uh, you have to remember that these places are incredibly rural. Mm. You know, uh, they were everywhere was a long way from everywhere else, and most people did not travel at all. Um, and so what we and what we had was um, a, um, a a guy called Alexander Christie. Mm. Um, no, no, and he owned he owned this farm, and uh, he employed a, a labourer, a chap called Patrick Malcolm. Mm. Um, and Malcolm had a, a reputation as a charmer, which meant that it did mean something different then. It meant someone who practiced folk magic. Mm. He could charm away uh, warts, or, mm. or um, he could find uh, lost lost objects, that kind of thing. But some charmers had a, a dodgy reputation as well. And in this case, he fastened onto um, the servant, Alexander Christie's servant. Her name was Margaret Barber. And basically he said... Do you, do you fancy having some love? And <laughs> he said, no, absolutely not. In which case, and this is a really weird thing, he, he stole her shoe and told her that she would not earn her wages that year. Now, now people who worked uh, uh, at the lowest level on farms in, in Aberdeenshire at the time, they would be paid annually or at the very most every six months. Yes. So they would they would live on the farm, they would they would have shelter, they would have food, but the, the actual money would only turn up once or maybe twice a year. Mm -hmm. So not earning her wages that year was was a terrifying thing to, to, to tell her. Mm -hmm. Well and um that night, that very night, stones and clods of peat rained down on the on the roof of the farm. And uh, this carried on for 20 days and 20 nights, and everyone locally turned up to witness it. You know, um, not only the local uh, uh, reverend, but all the other, all the neighbours, all the farmers, they all they all wanted to know what was going on, and they witnessed it every night. Stones and clods of peat would fall down on the roof, and it only stopped when Margaret Barber was was fired. Hmm. 
um, and and thrust out of the farm without her wages. So she did not earn her wages. Yeah. Um, and it, se- it seems to us as to manifestly very unfair because it may be something to do with you know Patrick Malcolm's reputation, but we don't really know what was going on. But I think there's there's something so weird about that. So you have two, we presume, relatively young people. Mm. One of them tries to cop off with the other. The, the other one, the, the first one says, no way. Mm. And that night, things start to fall on the roof of the farm and carry on for 20 days. Yeah. That That's one of my favorites because it's just weird. Yeah, I yeah. mean, as you refer to about the charmers as well, you know, there are several similar sort of situations south of the border as well yeah often we only hear of these people when they've been as malicious as 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 malcolm was in this particular case yes um most charmers led lives that did not see them enter the history books Mm. that is they led like the majority of people for the majority of time they led anonymous lives so people like charmers only come down to us through history when they basically done some they've encountered the law in some way Mm. you know when they their actions have upset some people so either they've been accused of something or they've been involved in a court case or they have been fired by their employer and they've taken revenge and the employer has then taken further actions or they found themselves up in front of the church uh, court in front of the presbytery that's and and someone has written this down that's the only time when we hear about these people. The rest of the time, we have no idea what, what was going on in their lives. Yeah, I mean, the other sad aspect of some of these cases is that, you know, it's usually the young maid servant that's usually f- framed as the focus or, yes, or, yes. or whatever. And it, that's, you know, being sacked for, for, for allegedly manifesting a poltergeist is probably not the best thing to have on a young woman's CV. In those yes, I would, say, I would say her resume is probably severely damaged by that. But it's quite frustrating, this case, in a way, because the record just stopped. So we don't know what happened to Margaret Barber. But I'm guessing it would have been really difficult to get a job after that, because all the neighbours knew that somehow she was involved in this demonic infestation. Uh, with with that uh, that had affected this, the farm where she was working for twenty twenty nights, so yeah, probably probably not a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I loved about some of the other stories, especially from the older older centuries, is the fact that the the locality seemed to think, oh, brilliant, we've got we've got a, a new form of entertainment for, and the yeah, people I, would just turn up to watch it. Yeah, yeah, and you see this again and again particularly in 17th century cases. I I mean, you know, life was probably pretty dull in the countryside, to be honest. You know, it was like, oh, look, there's a new hayrick. Oh, you know. um, (laughs) know, But, you know, so, but put it in the context of the time. Uh, People in London paid to go to mental asylums and watch the antics of the disturbed. Now, we think that's unpleasant now but at the time it was regarded as fine entertainment the suffering and bizarre behavior of others was especially in the 17th and part of the 18th century regarded as something that was worth pursuing Mm. and so in in these country areas where there's not that much news news like this spreads like wildfire Mm. and everyone turns up yeah, you know, and you find this again and again in these in these rural Scottish cases, and that's why we've got so many witnesses, which is yeah. which is which is great. So all the local farmers and their families, and any one of the local gentry, and you know, the reverend, and anyone of, of any of, of any curiosity turns up because they want to witness something extraordinary. It was kind of you know the YouTube of the day. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I love the majority of these stories. There is usually either um, a local old lady who's 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 come to convince herself of something, and she's she's generally holding on to some form of bedding. Um, yes. Or or the local strong man who's gone, no, I I'll show just I'm far stronger than this thing. Who ends up being humiliated. Yeah, that's oh, right. You also get um, <laughs> uh, relig- religious visitors being 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 mocked. 
Yeah. Their clothing cut with invisible knives or shears. Um, things, uh, stones being thrown at people, muck being thrown at people. Um, the poltergeist is 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 a real real snotty character in 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 the in the in these stories. Yeah, very much so. And they they seem to thrive on it in in certain yeah. places as yeah. well. It's as almost as if they're feeding off their notoriety. Which is which is one of the sort of suppositions has been put put forward that there's something about it's, it's like they they seem to be able to consume the energy mm. that that the humans um, <clears throat> through through the, through the humans curiosity enthusiasm fear shock uh, and other reactions that somehow this generates energy that they, and the poltergeist gets stronger mm. uh, reaches a crescendo and then then they fade away. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's an interesting aspect to to a lot of as as you refer to there some of the older cases is that if you look at the evidence and the sheer amount of witnesses there are only two conclusions either it's happened or they're all lying. Yes, that, 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 that this is, and and this brings me to one of my sort of like my favourite sort of hobby horses. Um, this is the kind of thing that really annoys journalists. <laughs> I take the view that there's no such thing as the paranormal. Either it happened, in which case it's normal, or it didn't happen, in which case it's fantasy. Yeah. You know, and, and I think you know a lot of the paranormal, we, we have this sort of woo element of the paranormal. But when you sort of break it down, either this is real, in which case it's not paranormal, it is just a new normal of the world, or it didn't happen. And as you say, if it did happen, that's really shocking. That's really a real, a real shock to our belief system about how the world operates. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't happen, these dozens of witnesses um, who put their name to things were all lying. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I once had the privilege of speaking to Guy Lyon Playfair. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, who is... You know, uh, much missed and, uh, and and a, and a real titan, especially in this particular field. Because, oh yeah, the, um, the eminence grease of the of this of this subject area. Yeah. Absolutely, I mean, especially if, without the Enfield case, he's working in South American politics. Oh yeah, stuff in Brazil. It's, it's, it's just astonishing. Yeah, it's, 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 some of those cases are. Apt, I mean, the, the, I think one of those was an extremely violent case. And did did one of those involve somebody attempting to be poisoned? Yes, it did. Yes, yes. Some some of the South American pulps were were were, were uh, at the at the extreme end of the spectrum. Yeah, very very aggressive from what I remember. It's 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 been a couple of years, like I said. But he was he was exactly of that, and he, he obviously because of his experience with Enfield, he was he was saying regardless of the fact that yes, they caught them mucking about a couple of times. Mm -hmm. You simply could not write any of it off as a hoax because it was such a variety of phenomena witnessed but it, it's almost as if certain people and it, and it works both ways as well Jeff it's not just skeptical it's it's belief as well mm -hmm. but sometimes they will seize on one particular piece of evidence to go right well that proves it's all wrong whilst ignoring the the glaringly obvious other information in front of them this this sort of brings me to something that I find of interest. In the analysis of the cases in the, the, the book on Scotland, I find I found that in 4.5 percent of the of the cases there was definite evidence of hoax. Mm. And in uh, I, I looked at other uh, surveys of poltergeists, and all of them came up with some, somewhere between one of them said three percent, another one said 14 percent that there was evidence of hoaxing. So there's, there's hoaxing is ever present within within a, a broader stretch of, 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 of cases, mm. but I think there's something there's like a like a subsection of this when it comes to phenomena, when it comes to uh, the poltergeists, which is that uh, I think this is quite difficult to prove, but it seems to I I, 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 don't, I glean it from looking at lots of cases, which is that the the phenomena starts it's real it gets reported and eventually people of status turn up to investigate it 
It doesn't matter whether they're the local reverend or from the Society of Cyclical Research or a scientist or a police officer, it doesn't matter. People of status turn up to investigate it. By the time they turn up, the phenomena may have, may have disappeared or changed or declined. But the people at the focus of it, particularly if they're young, feel very important. Yes. Because, because special people have travelled all this way to see them. And possibly for the first time in their lives, they really feel that they are important. And so they may fake stuff to keep that interest going. This doesn't negate the other stuff that happened. It just means that when some people say, well, they fake that, therefore the whole thing must be fake. That that doesn't that doesn't compute. Yeah, absolutely. It is a frustration. But like you say, you have the other aspect where certain paranormal investigators will try and insert themselves in certain cases or, or will simply uh, focus on a particular piece of uh, footage or, or response or, or whatever that, that's as frustrating, I feel. Yes, I quite agree. Yeah, oh, wonderful. So, obviously, the, uh, your, your uh, la extensive library of... of uh, paranormal literature is is something to behold jeff uh, but as we referred to in the introduction you've you've found yourself moving more into into screenwriting in in recent times so how did that happen did you was that something you'd always wanted to do as well absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh no it, it it was simply the case that I, I i think by that point i'd written i think i've written 38 books mm. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I want a new creative challenge. Um, and I thought, no, shall I, shall I become a novelist? No, nah, that's too much hard work. Um, <laughs> and I thought, well, what do I love? Oh, yeah, I really love movies. So I, I kind of thought, maybe I'll, I'll give it a go. Mm. You, know? you, you never know. I didn't know anything about how to write a script. Um, and um, I discovered that I absolutely loved it. That, and that's it. Simple as that. <laughs> so did you did you just think right? I'm just going to take the plunge, jump in, both feet. Let's you know to hell with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I I quickly realised that I was absolutely rubbish at it. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, I I I had great ideas mm. and I had great characters and situations and I could write exciting and scary action really easily uh, but I didn't know anything about structure or you know basically how to do it mm -hmm. so um, I went through a long uh, process of education about that um, but mostly what I did was I, I learned by doing it mm. you know I learned from my mistakes yeah. I mean did you find that whole process frustrating because not that I'm wishing to cast aspersions on your character, Jeff. For for somebody on the outside, it, they would probably assume that that would be quite a simple trans transition. Well, they might assume that. I, 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 urge, <laughs> I urge you to try, listeners, and and report back with with your tales of woe, your blood, sweat, and tears, your your confusion and and your general depression at the at, at life and the fact that. You know, you cannot write for toffee and nobody wants to read you and uh, it's all rubbish. <laughs> That's basically the average day in a screenwriter's life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, can, uh, I, I know a couple here in, in, in Sheffield and a, and a couple of film producers. So I've, I've, I've had many a conversation. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, or being, being surrounded by a very similar conversation of, of mutual self-loathing, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the end of the world, and that's that. So, what have you, what have you found, uh, as as kind of got your juices flowing in in, in screenwriting? Um, you, you're not expecting me to say that I write baseball movies or or um, or intimate um, relationship dramas, are you? I would be in, incredibly disappointed in you yes, if yeah. that was the case. Now, I write <laughs> horror, I write sci-fi, and I write action. I mean, obviously, have you, you, you as, as I mentioned, you, your film that you wrote, um, Co Dark Co Sense. Co-wrote. Co-wrote, sorry, Dark yeah. Sense, um, was, was premiered in the beginning of the year, yeah. which, which is a very intriguing um, story. So what, what, what's the basic premise of that? 
Uh, it's it's um, adapted from a novel uh, called First and Only. And the, the basic idea is that um, the central character is a psychic who foresees his own murder at the hands of a serial killer and then tries to do something about it and fails. <laughs> Because if it was easy, anybody, everybody could do it, you know. Well, exactly. Well, there is yeah. always that kind of uh, minority report aspect to yes to, to anybody yeah. that if if you could if you knew the future, would you, yeah, would you right. do what you uh, could to try and change is, it? He can't he can't see the future very clearly. He just knows that he's going to be killed uh, by this by this uh, serial murderer. So that's the sort of that, that's the sort of basic thing. And uh, right now. I can't tell you much about the details, but right now I've been hired to write a British supernatural horror movie um, with, um, yeah, with, with, you know, there's supernatural and there's horror and it's British, you know. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Oh, fantastic. Well, I wish you all the very best in that endeavour, Jeff. Yes, thank you. Um, there's, other, there's lots of other stuff going on, um, which is this is part of the life of uh, the screenwriter, mm. which is that there, there's many, many projects and very, very little money. So until, <laughs> until project finds finance, yes. uh, project is basically dormant. But uh, that, that one's actually active at the moment. Oh, fantastic. Well, Jeff, it's been absolutely lovely speaking to you today um where, I, 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 pleasure as well oh well thank you um where can everybody uh keep up to date with what you're doing and and find your books okay um i've got a website um jeffholder.com uh, it talks about both my screenwriting and about my books fantastic and all your books are available on amazon as well aren't they yeah they are yeah absolutely fantastic well jeff thank you again for your time today um obviously speaking to you in france how long have you lived out there uh, five years now. Oh, wonderful. Enjoying it? It's quite pleasant. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Well, listen, thank you again for your time today. It's been a real no pleasure problem. to have a chat with you. And thank you for the uh, humorous and witty conversation. It's been a pleasure. Well, well it's been a pleasure for me, Paul, and uh, good luck with the most excellent website. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers.